Chapter 20 In reaching the magic shores of Wineland the Good, the Vikings had done much more than fight their way across leagues of water. They had wandered through time, too, wandered backward, returning through many centuries to an earlier era. In Wineland, the Stone Age still lived. We who live in the tail end of the Iron Age have maligned that age of stone, making slanderous jokes about it, by which we feel superior. We pretend that it has been so named because its men stunned their sweethearts with stone clubs and dragged them by the hair to their stone caves. Now why should any man do that when a willing sweetheart under the stars is so much more satisfactory? There is a theory that women liked it, but it is held only by men. Say rather, it was the age in which stone was the strongest, most trustworthy, most lasting thing known, the closest that one could get to eternity. Beside it, all else was measured and judged. Of it, you made what you hoped would endure, those basic things that daily saved your life weapons, stoves, or idols. In the end, that ever-present, necessary stone shaped your very thinking, and no vow was ever so binding or sincere as, I will love you until that great boulder is no more. Among the Stone Age's best gifts to the world were its women, one of whom was the Wampanoag girl who had fallen in love with the Sea King. Her name was an Indian word which meant the flower with the sad face. It fit her startlingly well and must have been bestowed when she was fully grown and her character defined. Flowers were always the prettiest things to which men could liken women, though it would be a greater compliment to call flowers women. Her face was indubitably sad. The sadness being of a great gentleness, such as comes from knowing that everything, however lovely, will grow, bloom, and fade. She and all her tribe chose to hold certain beliefs which made life more agreeable, without questioning too deeply whether they were valid. For one thing, they believed in money. The currency was a bead, carved from an oyster shell, and sufficient amounts of it could buy anything that was wanted. In this, they differed very little from the nations of Europe, with this exception. When a Wampanoag was low in funds, it was perfectly legal for him to gather oyster shells and carve himself a fortune. Care, persistence, and workmanship gave the beads form and polish, and were what made the difference between shell and money. This was understood by all and was why they set a value upon it. Those who liked to be thought wealthy wore long strings of it on their persons. Since anyone could indulge in such snobbery, it did no harm. They had another belief, which often accompanies the need for money. They believed in the immortality of the soul. That made them happy, so no one disagreed or insisted that they prove it. Had they needed a proof, however, there was one at hand to which they could have pointed. It was offered by the flowers. These two were thought to have a future life, since no paradise would be complete without them, and the heaven to which dead flowers went was visible. It was the rainbow. Love, the girl had heard, was an illusion, but a very nice one, well worth encouraging in oneself. If enjoyed without confusion, it would yield ecstasy. If allowed to run its course and vanish if it wished, it need leave no horrid trail behind, but only very sweet memories. When the Sea King put his arms about her, she knew they loved one another and was ready to enjoy her happiness as it passed by, which even at that moment she was sure it would. It was no gift of prophecy which she had, only a willingness to see, without bitterness, what the earth was really like during the 17 years she had been looking at it. Having seen, she was better able to pretend it was otherwise. Sometimes she did pretend and sometimes not, whichever she found more pleasant, 
and the result was that she always seemed a little more flower-like and a little more sad. In keeping with her self-deception, she never admitted to herself that her golden-haired lover from the sea was a man. When her companions exclaimed that the Vikings were spirits of light, she had only to let herself be a little more religious than usual, to accept it most fervently. She had never read that Stone Age classic, the Old Testament, but she had as deep reasons as her sisters of canon were believing that the angels came to earth and found that the daughters of men were fair. Her greatest test of faith was when he kissed her. Kissing was a custom unknown to her people, wherefore she had none of the emotional habits we associate with kisses, by which they upset us. It only seemed that a stranger's lips were forcing her own apart without her consent, and she felt that repellent. But as there instantly flashed through her mind the kind of creature this might really be, she hurriedly stopped thinking and abandoned herself to her feelings. She let him go on kissing her because it seemed to please him, and it pleased her to let him be pleased. Then his words flowed over her. She did not understand them, but their tone swept her away from things as they are to things as they ought to be. They met many times there in his sacred grove, and each time he spoke and she listened. He needed to tell her what she had meant to him while she was searching for her. After that, he had to tell her the new meaning she had for him, now that he had found her. And aside from all meanings and shadows of meanings that he was trying to convey to her, he had the compulsion to speech that comes upon any traveler at the end of a long journey. She felt no urgency to say anything. She was more timid than he, or less vain, which made her shrink from saying her poor words to a celestial being. He never doubted that his silent Freya understood. She did at first, while he was speaking of how he loved her, for then he used the ancient tone, look, and gestures that men revert to in moments of passion, wherever they have been civilized. She was less able to understand him when he began to tell her the adventures he'd had while finding his way to her. He momentarily forgot her then and spoke to the air, telling his Norse tale in his Norse tongue with a bitter little smile of memory. All she could tell from this was that he was thinking about the past and that it somehow distressed him. She reached for his hand. That made him remember her with a start and he went on to tell the rest of the tale directly to her, to lay it at her feet, he thought. He began to stress his own part in what had happened, his devotion, his persistence, his desperate decisions, and then she understood him again, having heard the braves of her own tribe speak that way. She knew that he was boasting, but that was after they had met several times, and by then she loved him so much that it did not matter to her whether he was man or spirit, or both or neither. When, a few years later, Good Luck lost his divinity and became mere Good Luck, he could still be proud of the heavenly gift he had bestowed on his favorite son. The Sea King had been given what most men do not even know they want, happiness so complete that they have to admit they are satisfied. He could not believe that any other man in love was ever quite that lucky. He knew many, who he felt would admit that their lot was nearly perfect, but it seemed they stopped there, dwelling perversely on tiny, remote possibilities of improvement. Some of them had a hypocritical way of complaining while yet making it seem that they were dissatisfied only on their loved one's account. If only I could give her the riches of the world. Sometimes it was the reverse, though it served the same purpose. If only we were poor, the better to be each other's solace. Or sometimes with more frank discontent. If only she understood me. And more rarely, if only I understood her. There were other small carping complaints, of which he was unaware, 
because the men who held them never spoke them and almost never thought them. They appeared dimly when love was at its highest tide and ready to recede. If only she were the least bit taller, or shorter, or lighter, or darker, or more outspoken, or more timid, or more something or other. Locke had freed the Sea King of all these objections, thereby making him the veriest lucky man in all the world, really in all of two worlds. He was the one lever whose sweetheart gave him nothing whatsoever to grumble about, nor even to avoid grumbling about. He found her perfect, their love perfect, the time and place for it perfect. To him was given what had been called a madman's dream, a perfect marriage. He had sought it all his life and found it the only way he could, by crossing an unknown ocean and returning to a forgotten age. The greatest possible adventure had yielded the greatest possible reward. They would have been unreasonable to expect such a high level of ecstasy to remain forever. They might have found it unbearable. Yet, when the first warning of a change came, they were deeply saddened. She, despite expecting it, he, because he knew what he had forgotten. It was the ship which reminded them of what lay ahead. They saw it one day, being rowed from its harbor back into the channel and anchored there with its dragon head looking out to sea. Then the man remembered his duty and his son. The girl remembered how he had walked from ship to shore and knew he would now walk back again and return to the place in the sea where the sun rises. The crew had it well stored with provisions now and seaworthy. They momentarily expected their captain to give the order to set sail, but days passed and the ship still rode at anchor. There was no thought of questioning him, for he had become infallible to them. They were sure he had a reason for the delay. And so he had. A desperate, hopeless reason, impossible to explain to them, or anyone for that matter, or even to himself. He was waiting one day more, one day more, hoping that something would intervene and knowing that nothing could. He made his anguish worse by swearing he would return. He knew that the very making of the vow proved it was hard to fulfill. How could he be sure? His paradise had been so hard to find, so strangely found, so nearly not found at all. Evil things without number could happen would happen in the wild, bloody places he must visit to keep him ever from returning. There would be the voyage back to eastward, a fight if any other ship should see them, another fight perhaps in rescuing Eric. Merely thinking of those distant deeds and places made Wineland seem remote, as if he had already left it and was now far away remembering. The old man with the nine daughters was calling him again. The white arms of the sea maidens reached out towards him from the green water. He shrank back, deeper into the embrace he loved. <laughs>